Analyze Asia is brought to you by Esavel. Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams across Asia Pacific? Then you know how painful that can be. Esavel helps your in-house team by taking cumbersome tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across Asia Pacific from onboarding, procuring devices to real-time IT support and offboarding. With our state-of-the-art platform, gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place. Our team of IT support pros are keen to help you grow. Check out esevel.com and get a demo today. Use our referral code ASIA for 10% off. Terms and conditions apply. And strategy-wise, this is the path that we went to. We started looking at options because we wanted to possibly buy options to hedge our balance sheet. But when we looked at it, we were like, this kind of volatility, very difficult to buy. If it's very difficult to buy, means selling is good. So in this case, I think low control leverage uh, vol selling tends to be a very good strategy because of the high carry. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leong, and the crypto markets are currently moving in an uncharted territory with the Ethereum merge completed. How will the crypto markets evolve with derivatives, options, and futures? With me, Darius Sid, founder and chief investment officer of QCP Capital. Welcome to the show, Darius, and thank you for accepting the invitation because I got it through Jackie Yap from Chain Debrief. No, thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, as a first-time guest on the show, definitely I want to dive straight into your origin story. And I know you came with a pretty interesting background. How did you start your career? So yeah, I, I had a bit of a different start. I started my career at a hedge fund called Diamond Asia. That was one of the biggest homegrown macro hedge funds in Asia. So, I mean, different because, you know, the usual path is to go through the banks and graduate programs and whatnot. I went straight to the buy side. And that was interesting for me because, you know, it's almost like getting thrown in the deepest end of the pool. So a bit of a sink or swim situation. But it was interesting because, uh, you know, you the learning from Diamond was very broad, meaning that you're not siloed into anything specifically. I, I was introduced to start trading immediately across different types of assets and had to learn different markets very quickly. So I think that, that was that was very good training. Spent about four years there, four plus years there, and then moved over to a bank at BMP, where in Singapore doing Asia FX, emerging market FX, and then was eventually sent to the US in New York. So yeah, just Diamond and BMP before QCP. How did you eventually found QCP Capital? Can you talk about your role and what made you begin that first foray into crypto? Sure. So, I mean, I, I heard about crypto, Bitcoin quite early on, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. I think I only started looking at it when I was at a bank at BNP. I think the, the biggest difference is that between Diamond and BNP is that, you know, BNP is a bit more regulated, uh, you know, because it's a bank, you have... Set, set hours, set shifts, and then there's a bit more leeway to, to look at look at things. So I started looking at Bitcoin back then. And I mean, I, I wasn't a b- true believer at that point, right, in the in the tech or, or anything. But the thing that captured me was the arbitrage opportunity. It was being traded at different prices and very, very different prices in different countries. So to, as a trader, it was like, mm, this, is, uh, this is free money. So, so we, I started doing uh, arbitrage between the global prices in Korea, Australia, India, a couple of countries. And that was my first foray into crypto. This was in 2016. The Korean trading, they call it the kimchi premium, right? Because it just keep moving the, the trades across. And then essentially, when you founded QCB Capital, how did you get started? And now I think you are the chief investment officer to you are probably leading a team there. Yeah, so I think it's more of a push rather than the pool thing, meaning that, uh, you know, I, I, I was being sent to uh, New York. I was uh, there for a couple of months and I didn't really like it in, in, in New York and BNP. I'm quite a Singapore home boy, la, so I, I like family, being close to my family here. And at the time, I was, I was also doing the, the, the arbitrage and I was, I think it, it, economically, it makes sense. It made sense for me because I was making more money trading on, on the, the, the kimchi premium and other arbitrages. So I decided to, to leave BNP and start QCP in 2017. Yeah, so I mean, no no fancy story there. I just decided to leave BNP, start QCP. It was two men at the time, myself and another, and then it was just a prop shop doing the ARPs and, and trading trading crypto. And that's how we started. So fast forward to today, we have about 80 people, you know, doing the same thing and, and a bit more. 
I'm pretty interested to hear about in your career journey, given that you have this very interesting background working for Diamond Asia and then follow for BNP and then now going into crypto. What are the interesting lessons that you can share with my audience? Mm. I think the most important thing that I, I did was probably to, you know, internalize whatever you're doing. Because, you know, I mean, it's, it was, it would be very easy to just, you know, you get thrown in the deep end, just do what you need to do and, and, and try to just try to do your job. But I think, I think it, well, it takes a lot of effort to sort of understand the, the underlying and, and really think about what you're doing. And this, in my case, internalizing market structures and how the markets work underlying the, 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 the trading and various asset classes, I think that was very important because I was able to then apply it, you know, when I started the business, sort of understanding market structures and for crypto it's about thinking about what, what market structures are going to look like and what, what they should look like. So internalizing what you're doing and sort of getting to the bottom of, of, of things, I think that that's, that's quite important, especially because, I mean, it's, a, it's something in finance, right? You know, you, you whatever you read in the books and whatever actually happens, it, it can be two very different things. So to actually understand the nuances between the two and the differences and what, what is actually going on is quite important. Mm, that's pretty good advice. And that comes to the main subject of the day. I want to talk about QCP Capital, the crypto derivatives and hedge funds being in Asia and getting some context. I've actually, before this interview, I looked at some of you. I'm a subscriber of Real Vision as well. So I've, I've listened to a couple of the, the discussions that you have there. And I thought it was really interesting to get you, get you on the show to talk about crypto derivatives in Asia more because I think there's very little coverage happening in this part of the world. So maybe to start, can you explain or give an overview of derivatives such as like option, perpetuals and futures in the crypto market and how do they actually differ from the traditional derivatives trading? I mean, for example, I know it's commodities, options and futures that use with minerals, oil and, and other, other and metals as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, by and large, they're pretty similar. You have physical spot trading. That, that would be like Bitcoin spot, Ether spot, the spot token markets. And then you have derivatives, right? So derivatives, you have options and futures and OTC, you sometimes you have forwards as well. So by and large, it's very similar. I think the main, if you can call it difference, the main interesting innovative product that 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 sort of ch changed the crypto markets a bit was the perpetual swaps. So this is something that didn't really exist in the traditional markets. You know, in traditional markets, usually you have a, if you take one, if you want to take a leverage, you, you get margin from a broker or something, and then you take a bigger spot position, you, you, you borrow, from, you borrow from the broker, so to speak. I think sometime in 2000, probably 16 or something, I think the BitMEX founder, Arthur Hayes, came up with this idea of perpetual swaps. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a derivatives trader himself. So, so I know he, he knows exactly what he was doing, but basically this product is a, spot product and it is a four hourly or eight hourly rolling rolling spot future so basically you are instead of holding and taking borrowing to take a spot position you are doing it directly in the in a very 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 short future contract that rolls every eight hours and then usually when you do a traditional finance when you do a borrowing and then you you to to, to leverage and and take margin you pay the funding there the perpetual swap has a funding has a funding mechanism inbuilt into the price of the eight hourly rolling contract. So the what what this change is that uh, you know it allowed the leverage to be embedded directly into the the instrument. And I think that was very innovative because uh, you know you no longer have to deal with borrowing and margining, and and that 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 allowed a lot of speculation to to be done very easily in the perpetual swap market. So that that's one key difference, and I think the. Traditional markets are starting to pick up on that and starting to use that as well. So we have the innovation flowing from the crypto side into the traditional market side. That's one thing. The second big difference in crypto is probably just a settlement layer, right? You know, you don't really have a prime broker. You don't have a, you don't have a layer where where there's a common settlement. You know, every if you do at one exchange, you are dealing directly with the exchange, and then if you do with five different exchanges, you're dealing with five different exchanges. Same with OTC desks as well. So I guess there's still a bit of growth to be had or, or some maturity to be had in terms of the settlements markets. But by and large, crypto and traditional finance, not too different. Mm. I, I think one more thing, I just want to dive a little bit deep, deeper. And I learned this actually uh, when I was in Cambridge working in a bar, I used to help my financial engineer friends to solve differential equations, the concept of alpha and beta in derivatives. I think one thing I would really want you to solve, flesh it out is what does it mean when we talk about alpha and beta in derivatives market and how does it relate to volatility? 
the concept of volatility in in, in options. Yeah, I mean, typically in, in in trading alpha and beta, I I don't think it's that different. Meaning that you know, beta generally the return that the market market benchmark provides, right? And then in fixed income is whatever the 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 risk free rate is in this case, right? Or, or rather, that's the sort of base, and then the beta is a return on top of that. Yeah, I don't think it's different. It's too different in derivatives. Meaning that you know, derivatives just provides a layer for you to do for you to have leverage or or for hedging. But but I think it's is the definition is quite similar to, to to what we're talking about here. So I mean, if you're talking about crypto, the L, the beta is probably the return on Bitcoin or, or or Ether, and then alpha is you know returns that you generate outside of this independently of 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 the the, the benchmark index. Hmm. That that is pretty interesting in how you're thinking about it. I mean, given that cryptocurrencies are speculative, high risk trading digital assets. How does the derivatives actually intersect with, say, something like a decentralized finance protocols? We talk about the compounds, RVs, and Uniswap in the space. Yeah, I think this is an interesting question because the way DeFi is set up as something to replicate your experience in traditional finance, right? So whether it be a fixed income product or a spot trading product or a option product, it's meant to replicate the exact same thing. The, the difference is that it's, it's supposed to give you the same experience without all the intermediaries in between, which is what compound is or, or, or the DeFi options vaults are. Uh, they're, trying to repli- they're trying to replicate the exact thing. It means you can trade options, you can trade, you can do fixed income, but without the broker, without the prime, prime broker, without the exchange effectively as well. So it's not an easy task. Because you think about it, that there's a reason why traditional finance has a lot of these intermediaries, whether it be for risk or for efficiency, for settlement. You know, they're trying to they're trying to wipe all this out and go sort of almost peer to peer, replicating the same experience. So that that's, that's very difficult, and that's the reason why I think it will take more time for it to to have to replicate the exact same experience or to have the same kind of risk profile. So I'll give you an example. Boring lending, if you do it with exchange or, or OTC desk, that intermediary there is able to take some credit risk. You're able to borrow or lend uh, maybe partial, you know, under full collateralization. Whereas on Compound and, and, and Aave, all this, most of the fixed income is done with over collateral because the management of the uh, liquidation and risk is done by a smart contract. So there's no God mode where somebody can, where someone actually takes credit risk or somebody can actually manage the risk there. It's all, it's all done rule based on, on smart contracts. So there needs to be a big, bigger buffer there. And so it makes it a lot less collateral efficient. Just an example, but it's exactly the same thing. But, you know, there's a lot more buffer, a lot more inefficiency put in to make up for the lack of intermediaries. So I think it takes some time for the two worlds to converge more efficiently. Mm. And I think one interesting thing that came out recently through the crypto crash is that the DeFi protocol stays relatively stable against all the contagion that has spread across. I think that's more on the CeFi side. But but it's, it's, it's stable because it's smaller. Ah, that's interesting. Let's say let's compare to, to the Terra ecosystem, right? You have a situation where you have $14 billion of a stable coin against a reserve of like $3 billion. So the fragility comes from the size. The fragility comes from the absolute amount of leverage that's in the space in that ecosystem. Whereas in a DeFi platform, it's a lot smaller to begin with. In this case, the reserve or the collateral amount is, is over collateralized. So you don't have the same fragility. I, I mean, we were seed investors in Terra, so we sort of know how the whole system works. Ironically, if Terra was a lot smaller, I don't think this would have happened. You know, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't be as, as fragile as it was. It would probably have been robust if it was smaller. So I think that 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 stability is a function of the, of the amount of leverage in the space as well as the size of it, right? So I don't think DeFi was necessarily more stable per se. It's just a much smaller ecosystem. That, that's an interesting point. And I think Kevin Joe from the Galore Capital was making this point that because Terra is actually getting more and more, the more, the bigger they get, the more insolvent they are actually becoming. Yeah, they, I mean, ironically, it's a bit of a victim of their own success, right? But, but yeah, I know definitely that, that was the case. Mm. I, I think one interesting thing I always want to understand is like when people do crypto derivatives trading, does, does one need to have an investment thesis to make a directional trade? I, I quote this from Arthur Hayes' blog's post because I've been reading him quite a lot lately. And I think the way he explained the three arrows capitals demise was, I think one of the interesting points he pointed out is that in order to make a bigger gain in, in terms of doing this kind of hedge fund trading in crypto world, you, the size of the position matters, but also the, the directional trade has, is also another thing that matters as well. Yeah, I, I think on a very basic level, any trading requires a thesis. I mean, let's be clear about that. And what exactly does 
derivatives add to trading, right? I mean, again, it adds leverage. It also creates certain payoffs for certain path dependencies. So if you use perpetual swaps or use futures, you add leverage, you, you make your trade bigger. And that actually, you require a bit more of a thesis because your, your margin for error starts to shrink. You get stopped out and you start to, to lose money if your trade goes against you. Whereas if you're doing spot, you can hold it forever, technically speaking. So, so you, de- you definitely need to have a, more sh- a sharper investment thesis and a more specific one. If you're doing options, then you're introducing path dependency, right? meaning like you make a certain payoff if spot hits a certain level at this time. So again, using leverage and using derivatives, you start to need to have an even more specific and even more path dependent investment thesis for you to make money. So I, I think the answer is yes, and then even more so. I'm keen to double click on the derivatives market and the concept of carry. So I have two questions that on that. So the first is that there's definitely an opportunity in terms of market making. So given high volumes of crypto trade that's going on in Asia, and I think this is something that most of the Western crypto media don't really talk about. I think the question always comes back to me is, is volume selling a form of carry for for a hedge fund in Asia, or is it just a form of yield generation because you're selling volatility? Yeah. To answer your first question, whether it's an opportunity in market making, yes, probably, but it's getting very competitive. I mean, then again, it depends what you're market making, right? If you're talking about market making spot and Delta One, which is like perps and, and futures, the same guys who are doing the who are doing it in Trap are doing it in crypto as well, right? You know, guys like Jump, Tower Research. I mean, they are they are all, all over the space. So unless you want to compete with them, you know, these HFD kind of guys, I, I, I don't, I think the, the, the opportunity is, is quite, is, is not, not as fat as people think. For us, I mean, we, we tend to, we do market making in, in stuff like options and, and, and forwards. It's lower frequency stuff, but again, the way we're doing it is very similar to how banks and other hedge funds are doing it, right? You know, we have our own internal models and, and all of that. So market making, I think still remains more institutional and activity. What was the second question again? So is volume selling more like a form of... Yeah, vol selling. I think it's a, big, it's a good opportunity. Again, because it, I decided to, to start doing options in 2018 for this reason, right? You know, from coming from traditional markets, when we were doing FX, the volatility there, implied volatility rather, the price of options usually was below. And this is the same for equities and FX commodities to some extent as well. The markets, the volatility markets are quite efficient. The option markets are quite efficient, right? Typically, the implied vols tend to trade below the realized or around the realized vol. And the vols were quite low and are still quite relatively low as well. And if you look at crypto, you have a, asset, a frontier asset class where implied volatility tr- tends to trade above the realized because of the speculative, because of, because of how speculative it is, right? People are paying for optionality. And the... Implied volatility is the uh, triple figure, right? You know, you are talking about 100 plus percent, right? Whereas you compare to like FX, it's probably like single digit. So vol selling was the first strategy we did, right? Because the implied vols are so high, it makes for very, very good carry. So, so and I think it still remains a good strategy. If But of course, control the leverage. But it's a very, very good carry strategy for the simple reason that the vols are that high. Mm. And also given that we are in the beginning of the market, right? As well, because of the new protocols that are coming up, they all need forms of financial instruments in order to grow, to bootstrap their growth. Yeah, yeah, well. no, for sure. So, I mean, not, it's not just the fact that the vol base is high in triple digits. It's the fact that the implied vols are even higher, right? It's trading at a premium to the to the realized vol. So, that's one thing. And then, like like you said, it's a new market. So, I always compare this to gold, right? You know, gold, gold options versus gold spot. You know, gold options is like eight times the size. In, in crypto, you have the crypto options market less than 2% of the size of spot, right? So, the opportunity for growth is, is, is there. So, it's a frontier asset. It's a derivative on a frontier asset. So, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities as well. But strategy-wise, this is the path that we went to. We started looking at options because we wanted to possibly buy options to hedge our balance sheet. But when we looked at it, we were like, wow, this kind of volatility, very difficult to buy. So if, and if it's very difficult to buy, means selling is good. So in this case, I think low control leverage uh, vol selling tends to be a very good strategy because of the high carry. I'm recently reading a book on uh, Jay Gold, which is the person who almost crashed the market with gold trading about 100 years ago. And one interesting analogy I learned from reading his book, reading the book about his life is that a lot of what today is happening in terms of crypto trading is also similar to what was happening a hundred years ago, but maybe the context is a little bit different. Maybe the markets wise is very different. What does it really mean when we say carry in crypto derivatives? So is it becoming cash and carry or is it just curve trading? Both, right? Carry, 
It's a general term for not a delta neutral, you know, fixed income type returns. So you have the cash and carry, uh, which is essentially is curve trading as well. Uh, you know, you're buying spot, selling, selling contango, or you are, or you are selling spot, buying the backwardation. The curve trading, you mean like, you mean like just pure curve trading in terms of like perps versus versus. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, not that one is not that that one is not risk free, right? I mean, you need to have a view on what the funding is like and what, what how the curves behave. But yeah, I mean, that's those are carry strategies as well. Again, fits the criteria: delta neutral and fixed income type returns. Mm. I want to understand a little bit more. I think you you being in QCB Capital, you definitely deal with LPs. I think for today, in today's world, right, the LPs are also getting very sophisticated. They are probably reading the same stuff that we're reading on blogs, etc. What is the education required to bring them on board about crypto and specifically D5, given the, the type of risk that risky assets they are? <clears throat> Actually, I, I don't think that there's much additional education. To me, trading crypto... There are a lot of similarities to trading traffic assets, right? I mean, if if they have if they have been trading equities, commodities, FX, interest rates, they won't be too unfamiliar with crypto. It's just different underlying with the same kind of market structures. I mean, there are nuances again, like perpetual swaps and and and, and these, but I don't think that there's too much too too different. DeFi is probably a bit trickier. The the mechanisms of uh, interacting with DeFi and settling in DeFi can be quite tricky. So that bit. Probably need some, and, and it's again, it's protocol specific, right? You know, protocol specific, chain specific. If you're a traditional markets person, I mean, obviously it's good to educate yourself as to how to deal with DeFi. But again, I don't see DeFi as too different from CeFi as well. It's just doing the same things without the intermediary. So in this case, I, I, I tend to see DeFi as a bit more of a distribution layer for a lot of uh, the same products. I'm of the opinion that if you have access to good infrastructure in DeFi, it's prob- probably don't need to go to DeFi, right? But if you do want to, you know, I think the education is very nitty gritty in terms of how you deal with each protocol and how you settle. Mm. So I think crypto derivatives trading globally so that it can be executed any everywhere and anywhere. I mean, one thing I'm really curious in this conversation, and I thought it's great to have someone in Asia Pacific to tell me this. Are there nuances in terms for the Asia Pacific region and are there differences, at least from your experience with QCB Capital itself? Yeah, many ways to answer this question. There are nuances in the behavior for, you know, price behavior between the centers. Obviously, the, the Asia tends to have speculators, miners. Then you have more insti guys coming in when London, London happens. And it's the same with traditional markets as well, right? Different behavior for different markets. But uh, by and large... Most of the venues that we trade on and the, even ourselves, we are 24-7. So there's not much difference in terms of the way you trade it. 24-7. So you probably have teams really checking what is going on because, yeah, it's true because then the US markets will open and then there is a deal. But is the trade behavior different from... Again, the, the trading behaviors always tend to be different, right? I mean, at, at different hours, you have, at, you know, when the markets cross over, you have volatility. You know, at, at, at different hours, you have, uh, you know, different kinds of liquidity profiles as well. But I mean, again, not not different from traditional market. So so I think it's very similar in that sense. It's, it's a trading thing, not, not a crypto trading thing per, per se. But uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the only difference is that crypto trades the weekends as well. I think that's probably the biggest difference actually. Interesting. So given the misconception of BTC as an inflation hedge, I think is currently debunked and also because of the Ethereum merge happened. I think, how do we actually look at crypto digital assets? I mean, there's a way to, I always like to think about a stock. A stock is basically a bond or a call option. So let's say Amazon is a bond, Bitcoin, I can call it a bond. And then, then everything else is a call option. Like Tesla is a call option. And then maybe I'll take Solana as a call option as well. So I, I, I think are they just core options really highly correlated with the S&P 500? Yeah, I, I don't, I never ever thought that Bitcoin was an inflation hedge. I mean, they, Bitcoin is a risk asset, right? And it would, and, and I'm, I mean, it's become more correlated in recent times because I think ironically, because it's being traded more and being recognized more as a, a legitimate asset, it's become, you know, part of the risk on risk off the way people trade. So I think, I think the way you do to look at it is, as a risk asset, there, there are going to be idiosyncrasies with, with each asset and there are going to be differences. Like for example, when there's the Ethereum merge, there's an ETH narrative and then ETH tends to move more than Bitcoin and then people are trading the ETH Bitcoin pair and then there's some inverse correlation there. But I mean, if S&P drops 20%, Bitcoin is not going to be spared. It's probably going to drop more. 
right? And I think that was very clear from from very early on already when, you know, people are starting to trade it as, as a risk on risk of complex. I guess the way to see it, you know, like you said, dude, I mean, your, your, your view is like core options. I mean, for, for, for me, it's a bit more like, it's a bit more like a very high, actually the biggest correlation is with NASDAQ, right? So people treat it like a tech stock and probably a higher, a higher volatility tech stock with its own factors that, you know, that, that have, that have impact on price as well. The way, the way I see it probably is that it is very similar to tech, very similar to tech in that, uh, you know, it trades with like with tech stocks, but I think one thing that's underpriced is this, right? That crypto is has an embedded capital market in it. So it's not like tech stocks where back then you know, people were buying pet.com and all this and, and then after that it crashed after the dot com boom. You have a situation where there's always going to be embedded capital market in it, meaning that if you're talking about the adoption of crypto for enterprise or for payments or, or anything, because of the tokenized nature of it, there's always going to be capital markets embedded in it. The capital markets is part of the tech. There's always going to be trading on it. It's always going to be capital markets a related activity. I think that's a key difference. There is a bit of a meta thing where it's not just purely valuing the future of it in terms of, of usage. It's, it's valuing the embedded capital market in it as well. That's, a, that's an interesting point. I think I once tweeted this out and said that if you're a Web3 company and you got a token on the market, you are already subjected like a public company on the first day getting hit by traders or people with what you call those the the voucher capital people as well mm. i think it's no difference you're just basically subjected whether you're at the start of your startup life or you're just going to do it until you go public yeah as that's part true. of that that's true on that i i think one interesting part is we share common investments in crypto web3 companies and this is also the first time we actually met for the first time i think given that venture capital is also a very different asset class from crypto derivatives how do you treat this asset class from your point of view yeah, I don't you know. Venture capital is an interesting one because I'm not a VC guy. We sort of like fell into it. We didn't go in as a VC. We were just knee deep in the space and interacting with these protocols and companies. And then we started to see value in, in, in picking up strategic interest in them. And it's very, very different, right? You know, it was a completely different game. To this day, I still am quite stunned by some of the things that happen in VC. I mean, it's, it's a very different market, but very interesting one as well, right? You know, there's a lot of alpha to be made in VC if, if you... If you have the right access and if you have the right view and right thesis, you get it right. I think VC returns are, are, are ext- can be extremely extremely high as well. So the way we treat it is we we focus on what we know. Companies that we interact with that are related to the business. You know, so for us, I think we've had the most success in crypto trading infrastructure as well as data. So I think sort of a simple strategy, like if you if you know the company inside out that it brings value and that the product adds value, I think it becomes a no-brainer. So that, that's sort of the way that we've been investing in things. When it becomes, it, it, it's, when it's blatantly obvious to us that there's going to be value to it, then, then we invest. I think, you know, outside of that, that realm, it's a bit more tricky. I mean, there are some things that we, we might not be uh, experts in. Uh, you might take a punt here and there, but of course, it's a bit more risky. I think for us, venture capital is natural because we are part of the, this growing and sort of uh, emerging ecosystem. I find it interesting as well when I was in Web2, I started off as an angel investor and then ended being a person buying public stocks. And then in Web3, I did the reverse. I started crypto trading and then decided that, hey, if I can take Solana at $2 and sell it at 150 can I do the same being an angel investor? And I end up becoming an angel investor in that point of view. I, I don't know whether there's something to, to think about in terms of being a trader. It actually gives you a little bit more perspective on how the market moves. From there, but what are the traits you index, say, in a founding team or a startup when you start to invent, invest in those startups where it's directionally relevant to your business itself? This is a very good question, and when you do VC, the the founders are extremely important. I think you know we we definitely definitely need to find founders who are who have a vision for what they want to do, passionate about whatever they're doing, and I, I have to be adaptable. I mean, doing a f- Startup and being a founder is not 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 easy. There are a lot a lot of things to deal with. But I think core to it is somebody who is you know has a very clear vision of what they want to do and 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 very passionate about the product or, or, or the business. Mm. And I think you already mentioned that the infrastructure side, the trading infrastructure side, you're invested in. I think you also looked at like for example the analytics. I think of some, something similar like say a uh, Nansen AI yep. on the type of front. I mean, are there any other categories in the crypto or Web three that you look at? Like say maybe NFTs? No. I am definitely, yeah. I don't know how to buy a, a ape and penguin. So I told myself I can't do it. If I just pass the money to someone to do it better than yeah. who can do it 20 times better than me. 
No, I think we 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 are quite agnostic, right? So, so we we actually have invested in a lot of a lot of categories. I mean, we've invested in layer ones like Algorand, AVEX. So, you know, we've invested in Game Five. We've invested in DeFi. But it, it tends to usually we we I mean again we it's not that we don't invest in these things. It's just that we 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 know we know certain things better. So for example, in DeFi, we are overweight on the DeFi options vaults because I mean that that's that's our we know the options well, right? We know how it's structured. When you talk about NFTs, we invested in some NFT financing protocols. So guys that do boring lending with NFT as collateral. So not, not NFTs per se, but you know, the finance side of NFTs. But uh, yeah, again, there's always, there tends to be a trading element to it. And again, again, the thing about crypto is that every everything has a bit of a trading element to it and a bit <laughs> of a finance element to it. So that, that's something that we can always pick up on in terms of whatever we, we invest. Mm. I, I think when we live in interesting times, I guess, what can we learn from the recent collapses of blockchain protocols, crypto lending firms and hedge funds that blew up? after the Terra Luna USD event. And I would want to be very specific to whoever it is in the story. I just want to get general lessons and what, what are the important takeaways that after this recent crash, I think happening in May, June period. The, I think one, one important takeaway is that what you learn in, in, in your previous career in finance, let's say trap fire, right? And things that things make sense there and don't make sense there. Sometimes if, if you look at the crypto markets and something doesn't make sense to you there, you might be right. Right, you know, I mean, I think that the reason why a lot of uh, this happened is because people just abandon a lot of the sensibilities, you know, things that don't look right, but like, okay, you know, this is, this is crypto, the rules are different. No, the rules are the same. So it's just how far are you willing to go to test the boundaries of, of sensibility? And I think in this case, a lot of things went way beyond that, right? But to be more specific, I think what we had here is a credit crisis. If you divide the space into, into various segments, this is very, very specifically a credit crisis. The amount of leverage and the way credit was being done was way out of proportion. And so if you look at the fallout of the crisis, the options market is doing perfectly fine. Spot market is doing perfectly fine. There, there weren't any disruptions to settlements and options operations. It was very specifically credit that got hit. So boring lending, if you think about it, you know, it was, the boring lending market went into a tr into trillion, hundreds of billions, maybe even a trillion dollars of boring lending without any interest rate infrastructure, right? You know, they don't have credit rating. You don't have a market for trading interest rates and money markets. You know, you don't have an overnight rate. The funding is all over the place. So I think it was very much a, a market that grew too quickly without the proper, proper infrastructure. So I think for it to come back again, I think uh, there needs to be certain pieces in place for a proper credit market to operate. Mm. So I have my one final question for you. Yep. What does great look like for you in QCP Capital? It's an interesting question, right? I mean, when we first set out, it was a two-man prop shop. We never expected to go to an 80 man shop. I think great for us is, and I think we've done great, right? Over, over this this period, meaning that we, we weren't hit by any, any of the defaults, credit defaults. We didn't enter the credit market, even though our peers were, were, were doing so. We didn't get hit by Luna as well. So... I think that's great in the sense that we, we sort of maintain our sensibilities. We, 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 we stood for what we believed in. You know, we didn't, didn't sacrifice that for the interest of growth. I mean, I think we, we were criticized quite a bit when the run up that these guys are too conservative. We've never raised any money. We, we didn't participate in boring lending. We, we did good by, by keeping to our guns and, and, and working on what we believed in, mainly market structures, the crypto derivatives options. I think great, you know, look, for me is, is two prong. One thing is for the industry to, as a whole to grow as well, to become more institutional and for us to grow along with the industry, right? And more specifically, I think great is, is to me, it's a more of a team-based thing. I think I, 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 for me, great is having a company of, of very driven and, and talented individuals. The size of it is more secondary, I would say. Wow, that's a pretty good insight. And I think that I will look forward to have another conversation with you sometime in the future. And there is many thanks for coming on the show. And I really benefited a lot from the conversation of talking about crypto derivatives because I was also trying to clear up my understanding on some of these topics that we are talking about. So in closing, I just only have two very short questions. The first one is any recommendations of books, TV shows, movies, or even websites that have inspired you recently? I think for me, it's more of a, I think it was a podcast that I watched recently with uh, Elon Musk and uh, Joe Rogan, right? I think he mentioned something that has got me, got me thinking that, you know, in 1969, when um, when there was the uh, moon landing, right? I think people assumed that growth in terms of technology will be very linear and that we will be on Mars by now. But people didn't think that 50 years later, the, the, the growth is through the internet and through communication with people, even having non-sovereign asset, assets as a currency. 
I think that, that, that got me thinking, uh, you know, about how growth in the next 50 years will be like. So I think it was, it was a podcast. So I mean, I'm not sure how people can find it, but on YouTube, but thinking about how growth, whether it's linear or, or, or otherwise, that's something interesting to me and something inspiring to think about as, as we grow our business in tech. How can my audience find me? How can your audience find me? I think Telegram probably or WhatsApp is probably the best. You have a Twitter as well, right? Twitter, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have QCB Twitter well. Capital. Yeah, yes, I'll put all correct. those links for you all. And there is many thanks for coming on the show. For everyone out there, you can find us on any podcast platform. And of course, tweet to me if you have any feedback, Analyze Asia. We have started doing advertising. If you are keen to, just go to the website and drop me a note. Once again, there is many thanks for coming on the show, for taking out the busy time of that. I will look forward to speak to you in the future. Likewise. <laughs>